So hello everyone, uh, welcome to my talk on software testing best practices at Devopedia. My heartfelt gratitude to Devopedia for giving me this opportunity to talk about software testing and quality. I really appreciate it and I hope that my talk would be useful for everyone. I would like to thank each one of you for uh, making the time <clears throat> on a weekend to attend my talk. I really appreciate it. My name is Venkat Ramakrishnan and I'm a software testing technologist consultant based out of Bangalore. I consult primarily for logistics and supply chain companies as a vertical, aiding them in their digital transformation journey. My social media handles are provided in the slide. I'm pretty active in Twitter at Fly Venkat. I started my YouTube channel on software testing and quality talks pretty recently, about six months back, which is mostly podcasts with practitioners and industry experts on various aspects of software testing and quality. As you can see, the channel hasn't hit uh, 100 subscribers yet. So um, that's why I have, have a bit.ly link to make the link descriptive. I would encourage all of you to subscribe to my channel where there'll be future videos on many aspects of software testing and quality. You can also find me at my homepage, venkatramakrishnan.com. So a bit about myself, I started my career in software testing back in 1994 and have been engaged with software testing field since then. I consult organizations on better ways to do testing using best of the breed methodologies, techniques, and practices. I do development also in C and Python, and <clears throat> I'm involved in some amount of white box testing, as they used to call it. Today, it has a new paint uh, called pairing. My objective in uh, doing this talk is to create some awareness about the best practices in modern software testing. Software testing has gone through a lot of changes in the recent days. I would say that the essence of testing still remains the same. It is still validation and verification. That said, the practices that we do have always been changing, sometimes to the extent of thinking, what the hell are we doing? But that's all part of the journey towards quick delivery to the customers. I'll touch upon the quick part in detail in my talk later. So this talk is going to be a generic overview level so that practitioners of all shades can get something out of it. I know that's a stretch goal because software and testing is a deep ocean and everyone finds their own sweet corner in terms of methodology, tool, or a practice. I would appreciate your patience in understanding that I can't possibly cover everything in just 30 minutes, but I'll try. That said, if you have any questions during the talk, please note them down and park them. We will have dedicated time for Q&A at the end of the talk. I'll try to answer your questions to the best of my ability but if you're not satisfied with my answer or need a more elaborate discussion, please feel free to get in touch through one of my social media handles and I would be glad to strike up a conversation. Who knows, it could possibly transcribe into a podcast in my YouTube channel too. Um, while you are listening to me, I would request you to place yourself in an environment where there are no disturbances like notifications, mobile calls, social media, family, etc so that you could get the most out of what is being offered. So let's get started. Are you able to see the next slide? Yes. yes. Thank you. First, let's talk about DevOps and software testing in DevOps. DevOps is arguably the focal point of software development process in current times coupled with CI-CD. There's a lot of discussion going on best practices in continuous integration, continuous delivery, deployment, 
service level objectives, etc. Site reliability engineering accompanies DevOps in handling customer issues helped by production observability. I have depicted the DevOps symbol right there, which has been around for almost a decade now. The main focus of DevOps was to achieve agility by avoiding the handover hiccups between development and operations. While the methods and tools around that objective have achieved significant success, the representation of software testing in this picture is not correct. The reason I'm saying that is because, as you can see, software testing is considered only as a phase post code between build and release. In reality, it is not. To find out why this is the case, we need to look in depth at what software testing is. Software testing is the process of validation and verification of both the artifacts as well as the developed software. I have provided a concise definition of software testing in my web page, whose link I have provided in the slide. You can uh, take a moment to go through the definition when you get a chance. As you can read from the web page, software testing happens in all phases of software development from requirements to production. The objective of software testing is to make sure that software that is being developed is doing the right things, which is validation, as well as doing things right, which is verification. So the idea of having a dedicated phase for software testing in the DevOps is not correct. That then brings about the question of why and how software testers get involved in all the phases. Well, let's look at what a software tester does at the first place. To appreciate this better, we need to understand the key qualities of a software tester, which is evergreen and will not change over years or change of framework or methodology, agile or waterfall. I have come up with three key qualities of software testers that make them as software testers. They are attention to detail, big picture thinking, and curiosity to learn. Anyone who possesses these qualities can be an effective software tester. I have made a YouTube video on this and you can access it from the link provided in the slide. Then you may ask, if a developer has all these qualities, what is the need for software testers? Well, historically, experience shows us that a fresh set of eyes other than the developer eyes is good in detecting the issues. Is this always true? Maybe not. If your software is simple and does not possess complex operations, then there may not be a need for a dedicated tester. But be careful when that judgment is being made because today's software is very complex because of two reasons the dependencies and the various attributes of the software, performance, security, usability, accessibility, functional correctness, etc. It will not be possible for a single developer or an architect, or for that matter, even a bunch of developers to foresee all issues that could occur. And that's why a fresh set of eyes, which is not buried in the code and the frameworks is required. Typically, this is a software test architect along with a bunch of software testers who can pair with the individual developers on each of the areas. This model usually works well. Okay, now that we have laid the foundation on why software testing and software testers are needed, let's look into the challenges in today's organizations. The top two challenges that I would say is software testers not getting proactively engaged in all phases of software testing and ask the relevant questions and not possessing the technical and soft skills to interact with various teams like development operations and production. These challenges can be individual or organization culture dependent, but these are two major ones. So testers have to actively hone their technical skills and soft skills and actively engage in all phases of software development, not just the postcode testing phase. If the organization does not let testers get engaged in requirements or design or coding, 
I would suggest that testers please escalate that to the management and get it resolved because it's important to have the software testers have the visibility of what is going on on each aspect of software development. The two other problems that I see are organizational. One, the organizational culture does not let the testers to take initiative and engage in all phases of software development. For example, a performance test engineer complained that he was not allowed to take part in a requirements elicitation session where the test engineer can give their valuable inputs. The second issue is trying to remove human testing altogether from postcode saying that automated scripts will take care of it. This is a very bad lack of judgment. Postcode software has several factors to consider. Integration, deployment, system and solution tests, which need human analysis and intervention. The tests run will depend on the context, so it would be a mistake to run the same set of automated checks every time. Also note that based on context, a tester might come up with additional tests which are not part of the automated suit. So blindly relying on automated suit and getting rid of human analysis and testing is a big mistake. But unfortunately, this is what is happening in companies today, and we need to educate the engineering leaders to make them prevent this from happening. I want to spend a couple of moments on the names of the roles that software testers take these days. Traditionally, there were two prevalent positions, one as quality assurance engineer and the other one as software test. Today, we have multiple quality engineer, quality analyst, quality assurance engineer, yes, debt, software tester, and so on. Although the organizations have renamed the roles as they want it for their organization, the responsibility of the role is the same, which is software testing. People waste a whole lot of time arguing about these titles and responsibilities. This is really a waste of time just putting it out there. Also, a personal opinion on quality engineering and quality assurance. You can neither engineer nor assure, nor assure quality. Both are misnomers. But if you get a paycheck out of it, that, that's fine. Don't bother about it. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. Are you able to see the requirement slide? Yes. Okay. My goal as a software tester is to get the most bang on the buck on my software testing efforts. You might then think that one, once the code is developed, that's the place most of my efforts would be in. That's not correct. Studies have been done on where the most defects occur in the software development process and surprise, surprise, it is in the requirements phase. Around 65% of the defects happen in the requirements phase. Why is this the case? When we communicate with the business and we tend to assume or misunderstand what they want and build something that they don't need. If we prevent this, significant cost and effort savings can be realized. Also, in a dynamically evolving product, requirements do change. And when the changes happen, it is important to keep the changes documented formally. There are several facets of the product that get affected because of requirements change. Project plan, constraints, architecture, coding languages, dependencies between the various modules, performance, security, deployment considerations, infrastructure, etc. If you don't keep track of this, there will be defects. In order to address assumptions, misunderstandings, and changing requirements, it's important to have the framework which involves participation of all the key stakeholders. Typically, the business, the product owner, the business analyst, the developers, and the testers. The framework should facilitate use scenario examples, document them, and have an automation component to verify if the requirements are met by the software. The built software in an iterative fashion would also be available for the customer to use and provide their feedback so that feedback can become the seeds for further conversations. Behavior-driven development is one such framework 
which facilitates conversations and come up with examples documenting them into scenarios and automating the expectations as tests the scenarios are stored in a file the scenarios are written in gherkin format there are several language backends available in major programming languages like java and python for automation of scenarios the key advantage of bdd is having the business as part of the conversations that define the requirements the scenarios are written in a user friendly language that's easily understandable by all stakeholders and note that any changes to the scenarios will trigger a run of automation to check if the software still behaves as expected after the requirement changes testers play a key role in these interactions in bringing out the issues and the blind spots that others are not able to see testers should be included as uh, included as stakeholders in the requirements discussion and should not be left out a common practice seen in the organizations is that product owners or the business analysts interact with the business and then they convey the details gathered to the development and then the development conveys those requirements to the testers what's wrong with this scenario is that there are multiple handovers of information involved and during every handover there is a very strong possibility of requirements not being communicated correctly or are misunderstood when discussions happen with business and requirements are being documented all the stakeholders the business the product owner the business analyst the developers and the testers should be present so that miscommunication or misunderstanding of the requirements can be prevented okay let's talk about architecture <clears throat> excuse me let's dwell into the architectural aspects of software development whether you call it as your goal business goal or your requirements i mean people have been trying to play around with these two words to signify that architecture is not important because it keeps changing rapidly and that is uh, most common in the agile days but that narrative does not convince me personally because to build something of value in a time frame at a projected cost you need to plan the architecture if there are small tactical changes in the overall plan or the architecture then we deal with them as we go by but if there are big changes in the architecture then we got to replan everything the resources the budgets and the timelines whether you formally do a renegotiation through a contract or you do it informally with your customer it does not matter change is change and it affects things when there are changes as a software tester i need to assess the change and find out the changes in dependencies and all the other aspects like performance security once more the architecture can be in the ci cd pipeline uh, these days there are tools available for that and as a representative diagram so that any change to architecture automatically kicks off checks and tests in the pipeline to make sure that implementation can be changed wherever required if you are not already familiar there is a model called c4 which is for visualizing the architecture i have provided the link to it in the slide take a look when you get a chance the responsibility of the software tester is heavy when architecture is being analyzed or being changed because they need to be in the lookout for all the stuff that gets affected because of the change okay next let's talk about coding so gone are the days when software testers did just the black box testing today software testers need to be aware of the coding languages in which the product is built not just reading the code and cursory white box testing but the software tester needs to be well versed with the paradigm used like functional object oriented or procedural etc they also need to be well versed with the design patterns so that they can suggest redesigning with effective design patterns while developing and refactoring the code 
In addition to this, software testers also need to prepare the test charters, test plans, and the test cases in advance so that they can bring those nodes during meetings while code is being developed so that code can be developed in uh, taking into consideration those test cases up front. Another important factor for testers to consider is the requirement traceability while the code is being developed. With the use of frameworks like BDD or other traditional methods of traceability, testers should make sure that requirements are sufficiently covered on various aspects. Software testers should have access to code so that they can monitor changes to code. They should be part of the team that, that's intimated when there is a change in the code. Uh, this will help software testers getting alerted when there are changes. Um, if they know about the changes after the fact, I mean, after the code is integrated and built, then that defeats the purpose of preventing the defects while the code is being written. Um, so software testers should be considered as co-owners of the code, although they would have restricted or read-only privileges on the code. I would like to briefly touch upon one practical aspect on mock programming or ensemble programming session. I have taken part in some of these sessions and I found them valuable in terms of having many sets of eyes looking at the code in order to make the code better. Um, one caveat is the change of roles for every three minutes. I found this time too tight for a person to reflect upon complex aspects of software and give feedback especially if the buzzer goes off while the thinking process is still on, especially when more than four members are mobbing together. With that caveat, it's a good practice to have all the experts looking at the code and expressing their views and feedback. There is also pair programming that the <clears throat> software tester can sit with the developer looking at the code. There is a limit of 25 minutes per session with five to 10 minutes break in between. In my opinion, this practice provides opportunities for enough thought process to be put in these sessions on developing code. There is one restriction though, that only two people can be involved in the session and hence session cannot be as productive as a mob programming session where multiple experts can take part. For uh, pair programming, you can go through Martin Fowler's blog which is pretty detailed. And for ensemble or mob programming, you can check Udi Zuil's notes. In either of these cases, the contributions of software tester in looking at the code from various angles like performance, security, etc., and providing their inputs is valuable. It goes without saying that software tester should be knowledgeable enough and prepared well for taking part in these sessions for their inputs to be valuable to the team. Okay, so next we will look at testing. Even as uh, software testers get engaged in the pre-code stages of software development, one cannot undermine the importance of software testing after the code is done. There are multiple aspects that needs to be tested after the code is ready. Functionality, integration, environment, deployment, infrastructure, business and industry focused usability aspects, system and solution level testing, etc. Of late, there have been arguments in the industry that if one automates all the tests to test the code, there is no need for non-machine human done testing. This cannot be farther from the truth. Testing is a learning process in which one learns about the behavior of the software and then validates and verify if that behave, behavior is appropriate for the customer requirements. While testing, the tester needs to branch out, explore and experiment more areas based on the context of testing. As required, the testers might choose to run automated checks for the verifications that they would like to perform but note that these are only an aid to the testing, but not the testing in itself. The human analysis and intelligence is absolutely irre irreplaceable, not only for deciding the right test to run, but also coming up with new test scenarios based on the context. There is another point that I would like to talk about, which is about exploratory testing. 
when you do testing you experiment probe and explore the software based on the context and what you learn this is part and parcel of testing and have been done all these decades and there is nothing new or fancy about it it should also not be used as a fancy term to cut down the amount of testing that needs to be done post code just for the sake of quickly delivering the software to the customer which seems to be the intent these days personally i would prefer to call it as just testing and won't like to qualify it with any keywords because that's what it is it is software testing all right next we will move on to deployment release and production <clears throat> so we are done with post code testing so our responsibility as a software testers is over no not in devops the responsibility continues during and after deployment and in production too how are we going to deploy what kind of infrastructure we are going to use reviewing the infrastructure configuration code are all part and parcel of analysis that software testers need to do to make sure that nothing is broken if selective features are being released to a few beta customers testers need to review the plan on the blue green deployments which customers are getting the releases and what are the mitigation plans if things go terribly wrong in the beta release another important thing that software testers need to pay attention to are the service level objectives or and the error budgets what is acceptable what is not acceptable and uh, to be in sync with the sres if the thresholds are within control let's talk about debugging issues in production new tools have come up that trace system state variables in the form of json and keep updating the system state in columnar no sql databases This new approach is important because hard coding metrics that are fixed or relying on the gut feeling of the experts in the team don't work anymore because of the distributed architecture of microservices. Software testers thus need to be well versed with these new age tools so that they are able to debug issues in the production when required. Let's also take a moment to talk about the business motivation behind continuous integration and continuous delivery. Why do we need continuous delivery at all? Because we need fast fixes and fast deliveries to the cons- uh, customer. Fast fixes because there is customers customers who are getting affected because of the defects or the outage which is loss of business to the customer. in many cases the fix is needed in a matter of hours if not minutes i would even dare say in seconds the key performance metric that customers look forward to is reducing mean time to recover mttr by constantly aiming towards reducing mttr further and further we aim to reduce the outage time for customers Let's also talk a bit about the commits that happen to the trunk and software testers responsibility on testing these commits. Of late there are calls for committing daily to make sure developers have something to commit which is to emulate big companies where multiple commits commits happen on a daily basis. This does not make sense in every company. In some companies there might not be anything to commit on a specific day. well let's take a step back to see why this commit ask came to being in the first place instead of doing a big commit of a large module which places a significant effort on everyone including the testers to validate and verify it which is also a risk for the customers because many things can go wrong in a large commit it makes sense to break the large module into smaller modules and commit in smaller chunks that way it is easier to develop test deploy release and manage the software in production but unfortunately this ask for smaller commits has turned into an ask for daily commit irrespective of whether it is it makes sense to commit daily or not so i made a video on this in my youtube channel to stress that asking for daily commit is just absurd take a watch when you get a chance 
okay let's talk about testing the commits to the trunk when commits are made to the trunk it puts puts a lot of responsibility on testers plate because integration of the latest commit should work well with the already committed code one may argue that they have done their fair share of testing in their local machine before committing to the trunk there are always surprises software testers need to analyze the changes in the commits to see how it would affect the already existing code and select relevant test scenarios and test cases to check if that commit works well for its own functionality as well as working well with the other functionality that's already committed okay <clears throat> so the next one is role of ai in testing which i i guess it's arvin's favorite let's talk about a bit let's briefly look at how ai is being used to help software testing note that i use the phrase help software testing i didn't say do software testing as with other automation any use of ai or ml should only be considered as a help and not as software testing itself the first topic that i would like to touch upon is using the neural networks for computer vision neural networks have a unique way of narrowing down to a possibility for example to decide if the shown picture is of a dog or a cat how is that helpful in software testing for anyone who has spent their life capturing modifying and updating the graphical user interface using web driver frameworks they know well how easy it would be if the program captures an image image and compares that with a previously captured image and tells us the result if they are the same or different it makes everyone's life simpler All, although the approach used by the neural networks is not conventional totally different from the screen capturing logic used by the web drivers software tester should be well versed with how the neural network works and how the vision comparison is done by the neural networks all of us know that context is very important in debugging and testing a scenario when as a software tester i am exploring a specific area i might need to decide which scenario or area i should focus on next based on my current context the issues i find and the priorities of the areas to be tested so machine learning can help in these aspects although there are a few products out there which can guide test orchestration orchestration using machine learning it is still a very fertile area of research and there is a lot of potential to start with you can build your own little machine learning model to point you to the next important test case that needs to be executed based on your context try it out it would be fun and it would be useful also note that even if you are actively experimenting with it you should be familiar that such a possibility exists and be ready to learn and use a tool that can do it on the job the next aspect that i would like to touch upon is selection of automated regression tests to run using machine learning this can probably be seen as a subset of the leading the context driven testing using machine learning but in a more contained controlled fashion the use case for this is pretty straightforward many of us know how terrible it is to sit and select the regression test cases to run from a test suit on a friday evening before we go home to our families imagine you build a model which can automatically do that for you with a click of a button how convenient that would be of course you need to be a to be the master who oversees whether the model is indeed selecting the right cases to execute based on the past scenarios and experiences but still it's a great time saver and would reap benefits on the long run for those who cry out no we don't write test cases at all my answer is relax you are still a long way to go from totally abolishing test cases exploration through charters is good but we still need test cases to account for test scenarios that we executed what combinations we executed etc 
one other area that machine learning can help is in picking the right input parameters based on context many of you are already familiar with combinatorial explosion because of the number of input parameters to test traditionally we use methods like pairwise testing to reduce the number of combinations can we use instead machine learning to choose the parameters this is something software testers need to look at and be aware of the final area for using machine learning in managing software testing resources is in the area of project management if we are able to better predict when and how many defects we are going to hit in a specific phase during software development it would help us allocate the right amount and kind of resources to manage the need instead of being taken by surprise i had this interesting discussion with a vice president of a well known telecommunications company and he talked about this concept again as with all the other thoughts that i shared this uh, one two would have a lot of ifs and buts and based heavily on the context <clears throat> to summarize using ai and ml in software testing would greatly enhance the abilities of a software tester to be more efficient and effective in the testing it certainly is not going to take away their jobs because human analysis is very much needed for software testing and automation is only a help or an aid to do testing but this needs to be educated to the leadership of the organizations as many organizations are firing testers saying that they have automation suits and aml in place all right so that brings us to the end of the session uh staying engaged and patiently listening to my rant on software testing practice a huge thanks to all of you and devopedia for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts once more all my social uh, coordinates are listed in the slide feel free to get in touch with me by any means if you have a question in software testing or if you would like to engage me as a consultant in your organization with that I would like to open the floor for any questions. Thank you. Anyone has questions? So I have a couple of questions. I will ask them. Go ahead, Arvind. So you spoke about uh, issues in production. Yes. So the question uh, is, uh, when issues come up in production, who are the first people who are asked to look at those issues? Is it testers or developers? Um, neither of them. These days, the site reliability engineers are the ones who actually attend to the issues first, um, because they are in direct touch with the customers. They handle the issues, and of course, developers and testers are engaged. when the issues um, it it needs a more closer look and uh, everybody contributes um, in terms of um, you know uh, providing the fix uh, so i would say the first level of defense is your sres thank you yeah, yeah. the second question i had was uh, if you are having a saas product uh people talk about uh, scaling up and typically you know if it's on the scale of facebook or google the product is so popular they get requests like 10000 requests per second mm -hmm. right so it's a scalable product my question is if i am developing a product how will i do the testing for 10000 requests per second without you know blowing up my uh, cloud bill so there are tools available for that and um, there are in house tools that you can use which you can have in premise uh, servers to generate that amount of traffic and there are dedicated tool vendors who can generate that kind of traffic for you uh, 
Um, most of the tools, performance tools, vendors today provide uh, cloud-based testing also. So you have to basically buy that service and it is not as costly as buying a um, cloud um, facility and managing things on your own. They do the testing for you, basically. They generate the traffic, they generate the performance uh, parameters required, and they do the testing. And the cost is relatively very cheaper than buying your own cloud service and doing the testing by yourself. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions from others? Okay, um, so I would like to request you to all go through the YouTube channel that I have. Um, as I said, it's a pretty <clears throat> young uh, channel which uh, with around 15 to 20 videos, but actively so many other topics are coming up. Um, as Arvind already mentioned in my uh, introduction, um, there are new technologies that I deal with uh, like passwordless authentication, uh, smart devices and things like that, uh, which I am planning to add a channel, uh, which is very uh, useful uh, because moving forward, these technologies are going to take precedence and they are going to be very prevalent in our day-to-day -day life. Um, for example, Gartner just released their uh, 2022 predictions on what are the technologies that are going to take uh, precedence and the technologies that Arvind mentioned actually are part of these uh, uh, new upcoming new age technologies. As well, there is a lot of um, scope for improving the software testing processes, the perception about software testing. Uh, you know, primarily, especially in India, we actually uh, look at software testing as an offshore service and most of the done, uh, time it is done by a third party company or something like that, which is pretty much against the spirits of um, having one team and having the software testing as an integrate, integral part of the team rather than having as a separate team or a third party team. So there'll be a lot of process discussions also in my YouTube channel on these various aspects, challenges faced by software testers, and there will be videos on quality aspects also, uh, which I really didn't uh, dwell in deeper into it today. But there are two aspects of quality. One is uh, quality from the business perspective. What are the metrics that we need to look at from a business uh, priority perspective? And the quality from the internal uh, requirements, how effectively we, are, effectively we are performing as a team. So what are the quality metrics related to that? So those are the two components. So probably we could do another session on that if um, it's okay with Arvind. And uh, there is also a BDD talk that I would like to do, uh, which Arvind had um, actually requested. So that would be an interesting topic for the next talk also. So stay engaged and uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel and also engage with me on the Twitter and uh, we can discuss further on those platforms. Thank you, Venkat. Uh, I will now briefly share my screen. Sure. Uh, hi, Venkat. Uh, can I interrupt? Sorry to interrupt, Owen. I have yeah, a question. Right. You yeah. have a question, you go ahead with that question. Yes. Uh, Venkat, uh, I mean, I've uh, been in the first minute. Uh, I mean, the session was very cool. But uh, I want to talk about the perspective of a developer. Where what is the initial best practice a developer can attain or to make uh, the I mean to make to make a non-buggy product? So what is the initial step or a, or a best practice that he can attain? <clears throat> um, I actually didn't get the question quite uh, correctly. Is the question about what are the priorities for a developer to start with? Is that the question? Not exactly, but uh, I mean, as speaking about the best practices, like uh, some may write with the developers go through unit testings, all those cases, right? So other than that, any best practices and can a developer attain so the testers works get reduced? 
Right. So it is always best to have the defects avoided or prevented without, um, uh, you know, of course, uh, we are putting testers job uh, <laughs> um, out of the line, but it is always good to have the issues fixed by the developers in the first place itself. And that's this the whole idea about engaging with testers uh, while the code is being written. So as I explained in the talk, we have the pair programming and the mob programming where the testers and developers can work together uh, while writing the code itself. Uh, so the testers can point out, oh, these are the corner cases that you are not covering. These are the boundary cases that you are not covering. These are the performance issues that you are not covering. These are the security issues that you are not covering. So for example, I had a discussion uh, yesterday with uh, Kent, uh, Kent Bank, and uh, he, we were discussing about uh, unit test cases to be specific. Um, Ken told that, uh, you know, uh, he could not find a scenario where uh, he could incorporate security in the, into the unit test cases. I didn't quite agree because I have seen a couple of books on um, one is Secure by Design, um, which is which explains actually about how to design at the first place uh, with security in mind. And also there is a book called uh, DevSecOps, um, which actually clearly puts forward a layered framework uh, about how to incorporate security while you are developing the code. So, um, so coming back to your question, uh, if you ask me what is the first thing that as a developer best practices would be, is to have all these aspects in mind when you are writing the code. Before you, you even write a piece of the code, you have these aspects like, how is it going to affect my performance? Uh, like Arvind asked, how, how is my soft uh, SaaS product going to handle that many number of requests? So these are the kind of questions that you need to have in mind when you are actually starting to write the code. Uh, even when you are doing the unit testing, even when you are writing the, uh, even you are developing the code using TDD or some other development process. And also security is so important. Um, you might have uh, come across the log4j vulnerability recently and how it affects the systems in various places and how some of the libraries have to be negated um, to take care of the fix. So like this, um, many aspects of uh, software needs to be kept in mind when you are writing the piece of code. It's not just about that particular unit or that particular module should work independently as alone. Um, you should keep the big picture always in the mind about how is it is going to affect the various aspects of support testing. So. Um, you know, the software when it is being released in the production. So, so that would be my input to you as the best practice for a developer. 